Yes, my name is Jamie Holloway. Um, I went in the U.S. Navy in 1989 through 1993. Um, I went in unrated, but when I left, I was uh, a petty officer third class. And what, uh, what prompted you to join the military? My grandfather had served in the Army during World War II. And just listening to stories from him kind of got me interested in the military. But when I got out of high school, I was kind of at a crossroads of, you know, what I was going to do next. I was tired of school, but knew I probably needed to go to college. And uh, I thought, I had a few of my buddies were going to join the Navy. And the Navy, you know, offers uh, the GI Bill to help pay for college. So. I decided to take the summer off and decide, and then after the summer of my senior year in 1989, I decided to join the Navy and went in in September of 89. What made you choose the Navy? Probably my friends. I had uh, about three friends and my cousin decided to go after I had decided to go, but I had a couple of other friends that was in my class that had decided to go in the Navy and I guess they had a pretty good recruiter because he talked me into going into the Navy. Um, you want to talk a little bit about your boot camp and training experience, especially being in the Navy. I feel like that's touted as being one of the more, you know, mentally challenging. It was. My son, who is uh, 21 now, he's in the Air Force. So I give him a lot of grief over the differences in boot camps and how they're different today than they were, you know, back in the late 80s, or yeah, late 80s. Um, but, you know, it was, uh, the Navy was probably, you know, every, everybody wants to argue about whose boot camp is the toughest and whose is the easiest. Um, you know, physically, I was pretty athletic in high school, so I didn't have a problem with the physical part, but, you know, there was quite a bit of physical uh, uh, but the mental aspect of boot camp is probably the, the hardest in any boot camp because you're leaving as an 18 year old kid uh, from a small town, small county, and then you're exposed to uh, people from every walk of life. You're used to your walk of life and then you get to see everybody else's walk of life and uh, it, it's, it's challenging and then you know you have the homesickness part of it. You know, uh, Navy, they always told me it stood for never again volunteer yourself. Uh, and that's what you're thinking in boot camp because you're thinking, I can remember getting off the airplane in San Diego. And I don't know how they did logistically back then, but it seemed like everybody that was pretty much actually in my company in boot camp was on the flight to San Diego or at least three quarters of us because when we got off, we kind of realized that, hey, these people are all together. And then you get on a bus and they take you to the boot camp. And then, like I said, then you realize that everybody just about on there is in your same company. So I don't know how they really get everybody there at the same time, but um, it, it, homesickness is a, is, was the worst part of it for me. But you get over it. You, you don't have time. I can remember it was the best sleep I ever had because you lay down at, 10 o'clock and next thing you know it's 4 o'clock or 3.30 and uh, uh, it just it went so fast, so fast. I can remember the first night I got there, um, we, it was dark when we got to San Diego and the, I think we got into bed, I think it was 2.30 when we got into our beds and then 3.30 the lights came on. And then we started our day from there, and it, it was it was pretty hectic the first couple of weeks adjusting. And but, what was a typical day like those first few weeks? Uh, well, the first few weeks were more an assembly line, from getting shot after shot after shot. I mean, I don't know how many times I we had shots. It seemed like we had shots every day. And then you're getting your equipment, and you're getting you know acclimated to. Uh, uh, just the lifestyle itself, having five minutes to eat, uh, you know, they're rushing you through. But, you know, their process is a breaking down process and then a building up process. Uh, so they break you down, 
at the beginning. And then after the first week or two, then it becomes a slow building process where they're, they're encouraging you and you know, seeing who wants to stay and who really wants to be there and who should be there and not be there. So, What were um, among, in, in that area of time, what were among your most memorable experiences? Well, for me, I was fortunate enough to get stationed um, with an F-14 squadron. And if you know what the F-14 was, and if you don't, you have to know what the movie Top Gun was. Well, I was stationed at NAS Miramar in San Diego, and our, we, I was in a pilot training squadron. So our squadron trained pilots, new pilots, to fly the F-14 and to land on aircraft carriers. Top Gun hangar was right next door. So I always tell everybody the story, uh, a chief that I, uh, I lived in his house, I rented a room from him at his house. And if you ever watch Top Gun again, you know the volleyball scene. Have you seen Top Gun? It's been a minute. Okay, have you seen it? I'm gonna watch it now. <laughs> okay, well in the volleyball scene, in the background, if you, if you don't keep looking at Tom Cruise, there's a car sitting in the background. It is a candy apple red, I don't remember if it was a 56 or a 55 Chevrolet, but my chief owned that car. And he had driven it to work while they were filming the movie out there. They saw it and asked him if they could put it in the scene. So I've ridden in that car. So it kind of makes me famous. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, that was one of the most memorable things, I guess, about it, and getting to work on F-14s and seeing the movie. But then you see the aspect of when you watch it after that, and you're like, well, they can't do that. That's impossible. There's a scene at the, at the beginning where Tom Cruise is riding his motorcycle at the very beginning alongside and there's F-14s landing beside him. He's actually on the runway riding, not on a road. But you think it's a road and that he's riding, but it's actually not. So you find out things like that and you're thinking, well, that's not really possible, but they made it work for the movie. That's cool. That's, um, so that, I mean, just kind of, I guess that's a little tangent to get off on, but like yes. the Navy and the Air Force actually have, is that, they have kind of a close relationship. I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? We see, we see the big, you know, ships and then the planes landing on them. Can you just kind of give an overview of who's who in those uh, scenarios? Well, the if you think about the Navy, the Navy is uh, pretty much an all-around force. The Marine Corps was developed out of the Navy. The Navy has ships, but the Navy has aircraft. So really, the Navy is a self-sustaining. We we basically have every element of the armed forces to an extent um, for that having aircraft and then having a mobile force which is the marines which you know the navy basically delivers the marines to their destinations when in more in the past than maybe today but in the originally that was the that was the the thought process i guess when they established um, uh, those other parts of the navy uh, so, you know, with an Air Force, with the Navy having an Air Force, you can travel with a, with a um, aircraft carrier to anywhere in the world and you have an aircraft base. Now, you can't land a Air Force plane on an aircraft carrier. They have to be designed, you know, to be able to, to do that. Uh, uh, you can have the same types of planes like the... Um, well, I better not, I don't get too technical. I might say something wrong and somebody call me out about it. <laughs> but they have to be equipped with tail hooks and be beefed up with their landing gear and stuff to be able to take the force of landing on a carrier because it's just totally different than, than uh, landing on anything else. Okay. How do they um, determine then, you know, so you enlisted, you went into the Navy, then what, as far as how do you determine when you have something as comprehensive as that, how do you determine whether you're going to be, you know, in the aircraft, more on the naval, what people would probably think of as the naval side, or uh, more on the mobile unit side? Well, you, uh, of course, you don't really have a choice. When you first come in, when you first come in, I didn't get back to the story, but originally I had, was going to be on a submarine. And I had some medical issues, and they decided that I couldn't go down on a submarine. 
because if anything had happened to me medically wise they wouldn't be able to treat me on a submarine. So that disqualified me from submarines. I could have gotten out because my contract was to go on a submarine and do a certain job. But I didn't want to get out. So at the time I didn't have a, they didn't have a specific job that I really wanted to do available. So they had this shore duty billet at it was VF-124 is the name of the squadron and it was a, 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 a pilot training squadron in San Diego, California, which I'd already been out there on boot camp so I kind of, even though the bases are different, I like the, you can't beat the weather in San Diego. So I decided to go out there, but I went out there as an, what we called an unrated person. So you would go to a place like that and you would work in different jobs uh, for the first couple of years. And then if you wanted to go to school for something, you had to re-enlist, you had to extend your enlistment to go to school. So if you originally signed up for four years that way, it could call, you could have been in six or eight, depending on the school that you wanted to go to. But the Navy has a lot of jobs that are, are not, um, I don't know how to say it where you might understand. Um, we had a lot, we called it TAD, which was Temporary Additional Duty. Okay, so you go to a squadron. When I first got to that squadron, I had to go into the tool room. And I worked in the tool room for about six months. Uh, and they rotate you out of there. Uh, but I, that's what I did for the first six months. Well, then they, the, the Navy has a thing called plane captains. As an equivalent to the Air Force, Air Force actually has a rate that's called a crew chief. And they go to school to learn to be a crew chief. Uh, but the Navy doesn't do it that way. They do that as a temporary additional duty where you go out, and I'll explain what you do in a second, but you, 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 it's a training program that you have to be a, you're a trainee for so long and you have to complete all these tasks. Well, then you become a plane captain. And in the Navy, a plane captain has an airplane that they took care of, like they launched it, recovered it. When it came back, you would um, inspect it. And then if you found things wrong with it, you would write what we call gripes and you send them to the shops, like the avionics shop or if it was an airframe problem, uh, you sent those uh, to the shops to be fixed. So I was sent out there to do that and I basically did that my whole enlistment because I really enjoyed it. And I knew at that point that I really didn't want to stay because I was only in for four years. I didn't really want to re-enlist. So to go to the school, I would have to have re-enlisted. And I didn't really want to do that. So I stayed and, and did the plane captain thing uh, my, pretty much my whole career there. Uh, of course, it was a little different in our squadron because we had, uh, at any one given time, we probably had 20 or 30 planes. And we didn't have that many plane captains because it was a pilot training squadron. So you may have two or three planes that you did the same thing on uh, every day. So. And you were in San Diego for the entire four years? Yes. I spent time in Connecticut in submarine school, but that's when they realized that I had the problem. So I went from Connecticut back to San Diego. And this was when, can you kind of set the scene, even though, you know, you ended up not having to, you know, be on active duty, can you kind of set the scene around, this was when Desert Storm was taking place? Well, I was place? on active duty. Okay. Just didn't well, get deployed okay. to Iraq. Um, I believe, I can't remember the exact dates of the, uh, the Desert Storm, I'm thinking it's 91 or 92, roughly, um, that it began. Uh, but being based on a uh, uh, stateside in a uh, training role, I guess, for pilots, we weren't the first to have to do the rotations uh, to go. Uh, and, and we also, there were different, there was a hospital ship called the Mercy that was there. And some of the people in our squadron were rotating going out to the Mercy, which it was in the Persian Gulf, and it was just a floating hospital for, for, for that. And uh, uh, that would have been where I was scheduled to go before it ended. And so when it ended, then we didn't, you know, they ended the, the, the I guess, the billets, well, we call them billets, the um, uh, openings that you would have had to fill for people rotating out, so. 
Um, during that time, how did you stay in touch with family? Was that I tell my son every day the differences between then and now because then there was a telephone and to communicate it was long distance. It was very expensive. You know, you had to buy an AT&T card basically to call home. So you didn't call home a whole lot because it was so expensive. Now it's like you're not even gone because, you know, you can text and call with just every day. Even FaceTime now that you can even see them, but back then you were totally isolated besides the phone. Uh, when we would go out on ships, you, you would get, uh, they would give you um, opportunities to call home and they were just very brief and short. Um, but communication then was letters or expensive phone calls. What was your primary mode of communication with uh, your family? Phone calls, mainly. Mainly. Every now and then and we'd get letters. Now when I was in boot camp I received, people wrote me so many letters. I used to, I, I got so many letters that we didn't have time to read them all. So I would share with some people that didn't get a lot of letters. And so, but then they would always want the same letter from whoever, whoever had sent me the letter. They wanted to keep getting the same ones. So, because I got plenty of letters, <laughs> which I was grateful for. Um, was there something special you did during that time for good luck? Or just to, you know, kind of keep your, your inner peace? Uh, I don't know, just mainly main, maintaining the contact with your family, you know, was kind of the good thing, especially even though you're, you're, once you get out of boot camp, you're still, I'm in San Diego, what is that, 2,000 something miles away from home. Um, and just maintaining that contact and knowing that your family's still there and um, I guess that was probably the main way that I, you know, kept at peace with myself and, you know. Did you make any um, close friendships during oh, your time? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I had people today. My birthday was um, yesterday. No, what is today? Today's the fourth. The fourth? The second. My birthday's on the second. And I probably had 10 or 15 of my fellow shipmates that sent me messages telling me happy birthday. So we stay in pretty close contact. Yeah, it's friends, yeah, for life. You don't, uh, you don't forget those. Would you say it's a um, And sisterhood. Because when I went in, it's, it was, it, women were just starting the Navy, because it was out on ships, you know, it was a mainly all male uh, because they didn't really know how to integrate females into an all male ship. And when I, in, when I was early 80s, I mean late 80s, early 90s, I think there was one ship that was all females. They weren't mixed on ships. Uh, they began the process about that time, but it wasn't widespread at all. But in the aviation community, uh, especially on shore duty billets, there were a lot more females uh, than in other parts of the Navy, you know, for that reason. Now, you have men and women on the same ships everywhere, so it's come a long way. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? Um, well, I went to college when I got out. Um, and got my degree and then I was kind of at a been at a cross you know you kind of jump around at certain jobs you don't really know what you want to do um, in 2000 I worked at TVA for a short time uh, in security at TVA for after I got out of college and then uh, I left there and in 2000 I out of, got on the highway patrol. So from 2000 to 2010 I was a state trooper uh, stationed here. Well I was in Polk County for my first year and then I transferred back here and so I did that till 2000 and then in, I mean 2010 and then in 2010 I ran for public office uh, as the circuit court clerk which that's what I do today. So I've had a long it's funny how your life leads you in different directions, but it seems like public service or service of some type has pretty much uh, 
dominated my careers in different aspects. I worked at a, a Dodge dealership in the mid 90s, did customer service in a Dodge dealership too, in, in the maintenance side of a, a dealership. So it just always seems like you always end up in some kind of service or public service of, of some type. Are there any specific ways that you think your um, military experience really you know, gave you certain ways of looking at things, certain skills that ended up, you know, transcending into other areas of life? It does. For one, as a young man, it makes you grow up. You know, you don't have your mother and your father there to do things for you. Uh, it, so it teaches you, I guess, values, I guess, in a way, or teaches you uh, how to do things. I still do things. Sometimes I catch myself People talk about me standing up really straight and having good posture, and you know you're forced to do that in the military as part of it. You know the whole, uh, and that stuff still carries on. I guess um, um, even I guess the way you raise your children. Uh, I guess more for career military people, it's probably a little stricter in that. But still, you 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 gain those values of getting up and making your bed every day. Um, um, for me, even health-wise, and, and you know, trying to stay healthy and fit to an extent, not as much as I used to, but um, um, you know, and just core values that they teach you, you know, in the military, and to how you treat others, and and how you um, uh, get along with other ethnic groups you know, in the military, you know, I, I'd never met a Filipino man in my life. But in, in the Navy, there were a lot of Filipinos in the Navy because the Navy had a deal, or the United States had a deal with the Philippines. We had a base there. And they allowed them to join the Navy back. I don't know what they do now, but then. So you had those cultural bar barriers that, you know, it taught you to deal with uh, because um, there were several, there were a lot of uh, Filipinos in, in the Navy when I was in, so teaches you a lot. Um, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or military in general? I don't know if it, I don't know if it changed any belief. I still have the belief that every abled body 18 year old male should have to go serve two years. Um, I think for, uh, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, just how it makes you grow up, it, it gives you a different perspective, you know, teaches you routines and, and you know, how to get along with people. Um, I, I, I think that would be good for uh, anybody that, that turns 18 years old. Uh, to have that experience, you know, I didn't, I didn't, one of the things I regret, I guess, looking back on it now, at the time I probably didn't think it, but when you think of Navy, you get, you think of seeing the world. And I didn't really get to do that. I got to see a lot of the country and a lot of the West Coast part of the country, uh, but being on the West Coast or whether you're on the East Coast, uh, they do what they call West Packs, where you go out for six months and you go in a carrier group and they go to Australia, they go all over that side of the world, and then on the East Coast side they call it a med cruise. So they go to the Mediterranean and visit different ports. It's just kind of a routine of the Navy in it like six months, but I didn't get to do that. Now I wish I'd have got to do that, but then I was kind of like, oh, I got short duty here in San Diego, so I'm in good shape. So <laughs> I guess it depends on perspective. Um, is there anything you would like to add that we haven't covered yet? Mm. No, I don't think so. I just, you know, I, I, I have, um, I don't think much of my military service. You know, I don't, a lot of people look at it and they, it's hard to explain. I feel like, I, I mean, I did what I did and I did it because for this country and for my family and everybody that lives in this country, but I don't look at it as, as, uh, something to be celebrated, I guess. I feel like it's very important, but I always downplay my military service. You know, I don't, 
I don't necessarily um, promote it. I, I, and I guess that's just a personal choice, I suppose, as, as uh, uh, I'm very proud of it, and I'm very proud of my son, but I don't know, I've just always kind of downplayed it for some reason. I don't know why that is. <laughs> or maybe a stigma that, you know, if you feel like you weren't deployed. Then, maybe that could be some of it, like it I could have done like more. a great opportunity for so many people you know, to be honest, to be part of the military and have, oh, like you is. mentioned, that brotherhood and sisterhood and so many opportunities. Absolutely. What would you maybe say to anyone who's thinking about, you know, on the fence about whether to join the military? If you're on the fence, I would say, I would encourage you to do it if you're on the fence because um, even if you go for two years or you go for four years, um, Throughout my whole life, it has been a benefit, whether it be from um, getting a government job, being moved up to the front. If you have, you know, if you have 40 people applying for a job in the government, the United States government, they move you to the front because of your service. And so it has done nothing but help me, you know, in my future endeavors, whatever I have done. Um, uh, I believe that it, it strongly helped me from every aspect. Um, it will help you. And from the perspective of Veterans Day, um, what, what would you say as far as, you know, even in a year with as much turmoil as this one has had and as much just different kinds of um, variety, you know, what would you say maybe as a reminder to people from the perspective of a veteran about, you know, well, America it, as a country and Veterans Day It in comes general. up with people, let's say protesting. You know, that comes up, well, you know, I served in the military, so you have the right to protest. Do I agree with the violence? Absolutely not. That's not, a, you know, that's a different side of protesting. But peaceful protesting is part of the right of being American. And the right that people prior to me served and passed away and, um, um, so I think that it, that's one of the most important parts is protecting those rights and that's why everybody I think or most people serve you know so future generations can have the same uh, rights that we have now or had back then um, yeah <laughs> how do you feel um you know, how do you feel when you think about the legacy of veterans that you're a part of when you think of Veterans Day? Well, I believe if you look at the statistics wise, and I don't want to say a statistic about the number, with the, the number of Americans and the number that actually serve is a very small, small number. Um, so I think you're in a small group that that gives you pride to say that, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, if it's 2% or 4% or 10% of Americans, you know, have ever served in the armed forces. Uh, I, I believe it's a pretty low percentage if, uh, from an overall perspective. So I, I think that gives you pride, you know, that you chose to do that. It, you know, unlike Vietnam, people that were forced to do it, but, uh, but I think from a voluntary standpoint, it, it makes you proud.